Thank you, Senator Steele. John. So we move to question time. Senator Wong. Thank you, um, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Mr. Morrison has described the New South Wales Police Commissioner as one of his, and I quote, best friends, end quote, and confirmed that as long-time neighbours they used to take out the bins for each other. Does the Prime Minister accept that by calling his best friend to ask whether one of his cabinet ministers was in trouble, that the Prime Minister has fallen well short of the high standards expected under his own ministerial standards? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Firstly, I, I do not accept that. Uh, well, I'm not aware that the Prime Minister has made all of the comments that Senator Wong has attributed to him. But let me, let me assist the Senate by referring to a statement that the uh, Prime Minister is making to the House of Representatives. And, uh, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, if I may, uh, yesterday the Prime Minister informed the House on four separate occasions that he would be contacting and speaking with the New South Wales Police Force regarding the matters raised for the first time in question time with the Leader of the Opposition. The purpose of his call was to fulfil uh, his undertaking to the House and to discharge his responsibility under the Statement of Ministerial Standards to inform himself of the nature, substance and instigation of the investigation underway. Uh, he does not intend, and neither should the Prime Minister, base serious assessments of his duties under the Statement of Ministerial Standards on media reports or comments made by the Labour Party. The Commissioner considered it appropriate to inform him on the nature, substance and instigation of the investigation and was also advised of his subsequent statement to the House. And the Prime Minister, of course, advised the House that this was his intention in order to satisfy responsibilities and he subsequently informed the House. But let's be very clear, Mr President. I mean, the implication of what the Labour Party is suggesting is that based on a politically motivated letter from a political opponent uh, to the police, to the police that somehow the Prime Minister should order. immediately terminate. Order on my left. That somehow I'm having the Prime trouble Minister hearing should the minister. Uh, somehow dismiss uh, uh, one of his ministers on the basis of a partisan, politically motivated uh, chorus piece of correspondence uh, by a political opponent uh, to police. And that then somehow the Prime Minister shouldn't be able to uh, somehow satisfy himself of uh, what actually uh, is uh, happening uh, rather than to just take rather than to just take his lead from the Labour Party and The Guardian. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Did the Prime Minister or his office contact the office of the New South Wales Minister for Police? And if so, when was contact made and what was the purpose of the contact? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I'm not aware I will take that question on notice. Senator Wong, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This morning, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said in relation to Prime Minister Morrison's phone call with the New South Wales Police Commissioner Fuller, and I quote, it would have been much better if it had not been made, because it is really, it is vitally important that that inquiry that is being conducted by the New South Wales Police is seen to be conducted entirely Order. free of political Senator influence. Wong, is Mr Time Turnbull for correct? The questions expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I refer Senator Wong to my primary answer. The Prime Minister gave an undertaking to the House of Representatives and he fulfilled, and he fulfilled that commitment. And let me also again say, I mean, here, Sen Senator Wong, Senator Wong is suggesting oh, there shouldn't be any political interference. Hang on, there was a politically motivated letter order. from a political Senator, opponent. Senator, to the Cormann, Senator Wong on a point of order. For, Can point I of order. order across the chamber? I can't. Point Senator order. Wong. Thank you. Point of order, direct relevance. The assertion of political influence is Mr Turnbull's. Correct. That was the uh, question. Uh, Senator Wong. Interjections are always disorderly. There were many, and the minister, I think, if he was straying, was responding to interjections. I urge interjections to not be made, nor them to be taken and responded to. Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the Prime Minister gave an undertaking to the House of Representatives yesterday. He fulfilled that commitment that was entirely appropriate. But of course, but of course I mean, this is an issue that first arose during question time yesterday. The Prime Minister answered questions on the basis of his state of knowledge at the time, and he undertook to seek further information. And you know what? It turns out that the uh, initiation of this assessment by New South Wales Police was a politically 
motivated leather, a partisan politically motivated leather by a political Order opponent. On a political my opponent. Left. This is all about the politics of smear from the Labour Party. Order. This, is, this is all about Labour's politics of smear. Order on my left. Order. Order. Senator Bragg. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Trade. Order. Tourism, Please resume your seat, Senator Bragg. I can't hear you. Please resume your seat. I'll let. As this is a forum for non-government parties, the time that is wasted comes out of questions from non-government parties. Senator Bragg. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. How is the Morrison government creating certain and stable opportunities for Australian farmers and businesses? Through Trade That Benefits Australia. The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Bragg for his question. His Senator question Watt. that relates to jobs for Australians, because that's the number one priority of people on this side of the chamber. The number one question that comes from those on this side relates to more job opportunities for Australians, while the number one question from the other side is all about mud raking and mud slinging. <laughs> Now, Mr. President, Mr. President, what our government has achieved has been to continuously create more opportunities for Australian farmers and businesses to be able to export their goods to the world. And the end result of our work in that regard has been that Australian exports are at record levels. And around this time yesterday, I'm pleased, Mr. President, as senators would know, that this parliament gave the final legislative approval necessary to enable us to proceed to ratify the Australia-Indonesia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. And this is a fantastic agreement, which I was pleased to see on this matter some bipartisan support in the passage of it. It's a great agreement because it's going to allow some 99 per cent of Australian goods exports to Indonesia to enter duty-free or under significantly approved arrangements starting from next year, from 2020. This is a great opportunity, particularly for our farmers as well as many other businesses. Indonesia will guarantee the automatic issue of import permits for live cattle, for frozen beef, for sheep meat, for feed grains, for rolled steel coil, for citrus products, for carrots and potatoes. All of these producers and farmers stand to gain significantly. Some 575,000 potential cattle up to $150 million of feed grains into Indonesia duty-free, frozen beef and sheep meat exports having their tariff halved instantly and eliminated over five years, dairy tariffs reduced or removed entirely, big gains helping our farmers, helping our businesses and creating jobs for Australians. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Minister, how will businesses directly benefit from these trade agreements and continue to grow our economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, businesses benefit because they're going to get those guaranteed permits to get into Indonesian markets. They're going to face fewer or zero tariffs, open access in terms of many markets. And this is a huge gain. For example, small and medium-sized businesses like Premium Fresh Tasmania, who are already benefiting from FTAs, but they're going to stand in terms of vegetables, carrots, horticultural product to gain too as indeed many in Senator Bragg's home state, my home state uh, will as well across, right across Australia. Or up in Queensland, take Ironbark Citrus and Anchor Foods over in WA, great Australian businesses, each employing around 150 employees. Uh, and they are businesses that stand to gain in terms of food access, uh, whilst others in terms of mining services, such as Taramis Mining Solutions in Mackay in Queensland, providing services that make mining industries safer, uh, but also provide jobs for Order, those Senator Australians Birmingham. delivering Senator those services. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of support for these agreements? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, there's been overwhelming uh, support from Australian farmers, business, industry in relation to these agreements. The NFF have highlighted the extent to which they lock in new trade opportunities for our meat, grain, sugar, dairy and horticultural producers. Uh, the Australian Industry Group has described the Indonesia Agreement as a groundbreaking agreement to dedicate an entire FTA chapter to non-tariff measures, a critical component of this agreement in that it provides the opportunity not just to address and reduce those tariffs 
that make it harder for Australian businesses to be able to export, but also to be able to address those non-tariff measures that can get in the way. The Australia Latin America Business Council highlighting our Peru agreement and particularly the opportunities there, not just for agricultural producers but also for those mining services companies, the likes of which I referenced before, and the Australian Services Roundtable. And I acknowledge Senator Bragg and Senator Van your attendance at the Australian Services Roundtable meetings Order. held here Senator earlier, Birmingham, more opportunities for, for our services has businesses. Expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In refusing to stand Minister Taylor aside while being investigated for possible criminal behaviour by the Special Strike Force, Strike Force Garrod, Prime Minister Morrison told the House of Representatives that he had spoken with the New South Wales Police Commissioner Mick Fuller, and I quote, based on the information provided to me by the Commissioner, I consider there is no action required by me. What additional information did the New South Wales Police Commissioner provide Prime Minister Morrison. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator uh, Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I would refer the Senator to my answers uh, to Senator Wong's uh, question and indeed to the uh, Prime Minister's statement in the House of Representatives last night, uh, which, uh, which I have already previously uh, referenced. I mean, let's just remind ourselves again what this is about. This is like one letter, one letter from a political opponent to police that uh, the Labour Party suggested should be a reason to dismiss or stand aside the minister. Well, you know what? If that was the test, I mean, that is just a crazy proposition. If that was the test, I suspect that the serial letter writer, uh, Mr. Dreyfus, would be starting to write many more letters. I mean, if somehow you can't win the election by winning the confidence of the Australian people, so you want to start sending letters, letters that somehow uh, lead to the immediate dismissal of a minister that is crazy and I mean you, you are you are so juvenile and ridiculous I mean the Australian people can say precisely what this is Senator O'Neill a supplementary question order Senator O'Neill is on her feet order Senator O'Neill is on her feet Senator O'Neill yesterday Prime Minister Morrison told the house that he had and I quote spoken with the New South Wales Police Commissioner, Mick Fuller, about the instigation and the nature and the substance of their inquiries. Today, Commissioner Fuller said the Prime Minister received no more or less information than what was in the media release. Did the Prime Minister tell the parliament the truth yesterday? Senator Cormann. Uh, yes. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Given Prime Minister Morrison is relying on his phone call with one of his best friends in refusing to stand Minister Taylor aside while being investigated for possible criminal behaviour by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad Special Strike Force, Strike Force Garrod, will the Prime Minister make public any transcript or notes taken during his phone call with New South Wales Police Commissioner Fuller? Senator Cormann. Uh, I reject the premise of the question and I refer uh, the senator uh, to the statements that have been made by the Prime Minister on Order. the public senator, record. I've got, uh, uh, senator Wong takes precedence. Senator O'Neill. Senator Wong. My apologies to my colleague. There is a direct question about the Prime Minister providing notes or the transcript of the call. I ask that the minister be directly relevant to that, and if he doesn't, it will be apparent. The, the, the question contained. I would call a, a relatively extensive preamble. The minister is entitled to reject or otherwise agree with assertions contained that there are preambles to questions. He's being directly relevant. Conclu thank you thank very much, Cormen. Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Like, like I just say to the Australian people again, there is one letter from a political opponent sent to New South Wales Police, a partisan, politically motivated Order. letter from the Labor Party, which Order couldn't convince the Australian people to elect them into government, which is, which, is now, which is now being used by the Labor Party. One letter, politically motivated, partisan letter from a political opponent, which the Labor Party is now Order. hanging Senator its head Senator O'Neill, on a point of order. Senator O'Neill, order. Can I please hear Senator O'Neill's point of order? On, on direct relevance, the question is very simple. Will the Prime Minister make public any transcript or notes taken during his phone call that with the New South Wales Police Commissioner Fuller? Senator there was no other question, Senator Mr. President. I've, that made was it. My, I've made my rulings prior to this on the point 
I ask senators, when they're raising points of order, to not simply restate but make the point about direct relevance. Senator Wong, I'm, I'm ruling. Senator Cormann is entitled to address the preamble as much as he is entitled to address the question. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, sir, Mr. President. The Prime Minister made an undertaking to the House of Representatives yesterday. He fulfilled that undertaking and he reported back to the House of Representatives. This is just, this is, this is just a, Labor Party, a Labor Party smear, a politically motivated Order. Labor Party smear, nothing more, nothing less. Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Investment, representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, which I think is still Minister Taylor, despite the police investigation. Order. Um, the United Nations Environment Programme released a report overnight showing that for countries to fulfil the Paris Agreement, we need to reduce pollution by 7.6 per cent every year over the next decade. What will the government do to bring down pollution by 7.6 per cent per year? Or will Minister Taylor just try to doctor that climate report too? Order. I, on the Senator, yeah, Senator Cormann, yes, I'll uh, come the, to that. Uh, Senator, uh, in breach of standing orders, uh, reflected on a member in the House of Representatives, uh, and I would ask you to call her to order and to ask yeah. her to withdraw. Um, Senator Waters, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that reflection and imputation about a member of the other place. Thanks, President. I'll withdraw and we'll await what the uh, police investigation well, finds. I, no, no, I, I, when I, and when I ask people to withdraw, I, I'm going to ask you to withdraw it unconditionally. I, I don't want to tolerate get, get into the, the um, rabbit hole where people start making qualified withdrawals. I withdraw, President. So the question is, what will the government do to bring down pollution by 7.6 per year? I call the minister, uh, minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. And uh, Mr. President, I thank uh, thanks, Senator, for her question, if not some of the commentary on the way through. Uh, Australia has uh, a proud record as being a global leader when it comes to making and meeting commitments that, uh, uh, in relation to emissions reduction. Uh, Australia stands as a very rare country who, in terms of our first Kyoto period commitments, we met those commitments and exceeded those commitments. We are on track in relation to the second Kyoto period commitments to meet those commitments and to exceed them by more than 300 million tonnes of abatement. And our government has made further commitments in relation to the Paris Agreement out to 2030. Those commitments are for a reduction of Australia's emissions of some 26 per cent. That's Australia's contribution as part of a global effort, and we firmly acknowledge that it takes a global effort. That's why they are part of global agreements. Australia has met and exceeded Australia has met and exceeded all of our targets, and we intend very much to meet and ideally to exceed our 2030 target. That's why our government has outlined very clearly, very clearly in detail, our climate solutions package. The climate solutions package contains the Climate Solutions Fund. That's identified to provide some 103 million tonnes of abatement over the peri target period. Overall, it contains other projects, such as the Battery of the Nation and Marinus Link, contributing some 25 million tonnes of abatement, energy efficiency projects, contributing some 63 million tonnes of abatement. Ultimately, we outline very precisely the 201 million tonnes of abatement as part of that climate solutions package, all of it contributing towards Australia, playing our role, a leading role in the globe, meeting and exceeding the commitments that we make, and doing so in a way where we encourage others to join us on that journey. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Australia's current Paris goals have us on track for three degrees of warming. And the UNEP report says of Australia's climate policies, firstly, that we have no major policy tool to encourage emissions reduction, and that's a quote. And secondly, that the latest projection published by the government shows emissions would remain largely unchanged to 2030. Does your government accept your own department's advice that pollution won't go down in this critical decade? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our government has outlined, as I just went through in some precise detail, uh, the mechanisms that are being applied uh, to deliver emissions reduction and abatement right down to the tonnage allocated across the different policy measures. Now, we've seen in this country enormous change in terms of the energy mix uh, across Australia. Last year, per capita investment in renewable energy in Australia uh, was the highest of any country on the globe. In fact, twice that of the next nearest nation. 
So Australia's track record in terms of delivering emissions reduction, of also seeing investment in new technologies and indeed the work of programs such as the Climate Solutions Fund and our abatement uh, purchasing mechanisms have demonstrated that they can meet the targets and that we can continue to make the contribution necessary uh, to make sure that Australia leads the way in terms of change and reform, and we absolutely stand by the success of the policies to date and our intent to Order. deliver them Senator over the Waters, next 10 a years. Final supplementary question. Thanks, President. We're certainly leading the way in per capita emissions and will continue to do so even under this government's targets, assuming you even get anywhere near meeting them. The cap yes, I'm coming to the question. Order. Thanks so much for the reminder. The catastrophic bushfires, half-dead reef and crippling drought are a product of just one degree warming. Your policies have us on track for three degrees of warming or more. Why is your government prepared to accept the catastrophe that will result? And do you accept the science of climate change, which requires a 60 per cent reduction Order. by 2030? Senator Waters, time for asking the questions expired. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our government is acting because we absolutely are responding to science and evidence in all its forms. What we don't do, what we don't do, is what the Australian Greens try to do, which is to take uh, tragic events, tragic events that Australia has a long history of facing, and automatically link them, automatically link them to issues related to climate change. Uh, we absolutely recognise that, in terms of Australia's resilience uh, and Australia's strategies, that we have to respond to all of the advice that's available to us. But we also have to make sure we do it as part of a global effort. And this is something that the Australian Greens constantly overlook in terms of the role of other countries and their emissions profiles as part of the global impact. Australia, Australia is proud to be able to walk into climate change negotiations, highlight the fact that we've met and exceeded, met and exceeded all of our commitments to date, and that we have detailed Order, plans Senator to continue Birmingham. to do so Senator into the Wish Wilson as well. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Can the minister outline how free trade agreements benefit Australian agriculture and farmers? Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Well, the widespread benefits for Australian farmers, businesses, and investors are a step closer with the enabling legislation for major trade deals with Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Peru passing through Parliament yesterday. There are about 85. 1,700 farming families working hard right across the length and breadth of Australia to produce safe, high-quality food and fibre for the world. Each of our farmers grows enough food to feed 600 people. That's more than 50 million mums, dads, kids and grandparents here and around the world. Our export focus is great for consumers around the world, but even import more importantly, it's great for our farmers and our regional communities here in Australia. Trade and our free trade breakthroughs give Australian businesses, including our farmers, access to markets many times the size of here at home and an opportunity for their businesses to grow. When we came to office, 27 per cent of Australia's two-way trade was covered by trade agreements. Today, 70 per cent of our trade is covered by FTAs, and our ambition doesn't stop there. We're looking to increase that number to around 90 per cent by 2022. And the passage of the bill yesterday was a demonstration of our government's focus on increasing market access for our farmers. Uh, the Indonesian agreement will see, allow 99 per cent of Australian goods to enter Indonesia duty-free or with significantly improved preferential arrangements. That is great for red meat, for live cattle, for grains, for dairy, horticultural products and sugar. Under the agreement with Peru, we've achieved significant new access to one of South America's fastest growing economies, and particularly for dairy, rice and sorghum being free from tariffs with new quotas, and the similar outcomes for Hong Kong. There's been a lot of talk in this chamber about support for farmers. There's no greater support for farmers than giving them access to markets around the world to sell their produce. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on what the Liberal and Nationals government is doing to promote free trade agreements and specifically explain how they are helping Australian farmers? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Australian farmers are world leaders when it comes to exporting and developing new markets. Our agricultural production is around $60 billion a year and we export $45 billion worth of that. 
Our farmers rely on their exports for their livelihood. The Australian Dairy Council, uh, I know you're a big supporter of the dairy industry, Senator Henderson, um, supports finalising trade agreements because they recognise that more and better access to markets is good for our dairy farmers. It's how they get a competitive price for their premium product. There's high demand around the world for safe, nutritious dairy products in international markets, and we need to capitalise on that. Free trade agreements preferentially reduce the cost uh, barriers to selling overseas and help us to get that product to people who need it. And just one example is the Chinese free trade agreement. 15 per cent tariff on infant formula, tick, already gone. 10 to 19 per cent tariff on ice cream, gone. Uh, already gone. Order, Elimination Senator of 15 per cent tariff on liquid expired. milk. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Minister, how is the Liberal and Nationals government building a strong economy for our farmers? And is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, a strong economy means we can give our farmers the support they need uh, while they wait for the rains to come, but it also means we're able to focus on increasing and improving market access. You cannot support our farmers. You cannot come into this place and claim to support our farmers if you do not support free trade agreements and increasing market access for their products. It is a misnomer uh, to think that a country like ours, where we export 70 per cent of what we produce, is somehow going to have a vibrant agricultural sector while we do fail to sign up to free trade agreements and increase market access. The Senator, enabling legislation—we're looking at the EU, uh, the UK post-Brexit, Brexit, and today I'm hosting an agribusiness strategic roundtable to grow our market access with our farmers to India. It's a market too big to ignore. Its food consumption is going to double by 2050, and India uh, is Order. somewhere we Senator want to get McKenzie. our product. Time for the answers expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. My question is to Minister Cash, representing the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to Monday's ANA um, o report that that was actually into my health record. This report stated that shared cybersecurity and privacy risks were not properly managed by the Digital Health Agency and had to be improved. It further stated that the last privacy risk assessment was undertaken in 2017, despite the Digital Health Agency providing funding to the Australian Information Commissioner to conduct at least four privacy reviews between October 2017 and June this year. Minister, why were these Digital Health Agency pre-funded <laughs> risk assessments not undertaken? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Dick Griff for the question and for providing me with some prior notice. Uh, Senator Griff, I have been able to uh, obtain the following information from the Minister. Uh, the Morrison government welcomes the Australian National Audit Office reporting, noting its conclusion that the implementation of the My Health Record opt-out was largely effective. The public should be reassured by the ANAO's findings that the government's implementation, planning, governance and communication were appropriate and the objectives were clearly specified in the legislation and translated into operational objectives and plans. Responding to the recommendations is a high priority for the government. The Australian Digital Health Agency will lead implementation of the five recommendations, which are to be actioned within 12 months of tabling in consultation with the Department of Health, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, medical software industry, clinical peaks, healthcare provider associations, professional indemnity insurers and state and territory governments. Uh, in relation to the OAI C itself. It is an independent national regulator for privacy, and I am advised that further questions about their work should be directed to the OAIC. I am also advised that the OAIC have confirmed in their annual report of their activities in relation to digital health that the four assessments on foot will be finalised in 2019-20. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the AMAO report was also critical of the Digital Health Agency's board and the fact that it's yet to consider its updated cyber security strategy, even though it was finalised by the agency's executive a year ago. 
Minister, do you consider this delay represents good governance? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Griff, the ANAO report found ADHA management of privacy risks were largely appropriate, and ADHA conducted privacy impact assessments up until 2017 and implemented system and consumer access controls. Uh, you will also be aware, Senator Griff, that the ANAO report uh, makes a number of recommendations, five recommendations, and uh, in relation to those recommendations, I am advised that the ADHA has accepted all of the recommendations, including that the ADHA conduct an end-to-end -end privacy risk assessment of the operation of the My Health Record system under the opt-out model, including shared risks and mitigation controls, and incorporate the results of this assessment into the Order, risk management. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Um, Minister, in October estimates, the CEO of the Digital Health Agency stated that the agency has a series of advanced cyber security protections. He further stated there is absolutely no complacency regarding cyber security in the agency. Minister, is it or is it not complacency when critical and paid for risk assessments are not conducted and cyber security strategies are allowed to gather dust for well over a year? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Senator Griff, I am also advised that there have been no security breach. Uh, there has been no security breach in the seven years that the My Health Record system has been in operation. Uh, My Health Record system security protects records from unauthorised access and guards against cyber attacks. The controls include secure gateways and firewalls, encryption, authentication mechanisms and malicious content filtering. The system is monitored around the clock by the agency's dedicated cyber security centre, which has been tested by the Australian Signals Directed. The My Health Record system has been certified and accredited at the protected level under the Australian Government Information Security Standards. The system is independently tested frequently to ensure the security settings are robust and working as designed. The Digital Health Agency will continue to work with the industry to ensure everyone across the health sector is working Order, together Senator to protect Cash, the privacy time for the and security has expired. of Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. I refer to the Minister for Emission Reduction's use of doctored travel cost in official ministerial correspondence to the Sydney Lord Mayor Clover Moore. Minister Taylor has told the Parliament that the document containing the incorrect figures was, quote, drawn directly from the City of Sydney's website. It was publicly available, end quote. This claim was repeated by Minister Birmingham yesterday when he told the ABC that, and I quote, the information was sourced from the City of Sydney website. Does the minister stand by this statement? The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, that is, uh, that is the advice of Minister Taylor. Oh. Order. Order. I will call Senator Keneally. Uh, order. Senator Watt, your colleague is on her feet. Order. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. The minister's own department has confirmed at Senate estimates that the department had nothing to do with the doctored figures ending up in official ministerial correspondent. Given the doctored travel costs didn't come from his department, where did they come from? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, I refer the senator once again to Mr. Taylor's statement that clearly outlines where he Order. says they came from. Senator Watt. Senator Watt, I'm going to ask you to count to 30 from now on after I call your name. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. When Order. asked yesterday where the doctored document came from, Mr. Birmingham told the ABC that, and I quote, all I can point to there is the statement that has been made. Why has Minister Taylor failed to make public any document that confirms his version of events? And why is the minister willing to simply ignore all other evidence and accept Minister Taylor's word for it? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, once again, uh, Mr. Taylor has made a statement that details 
where the documents yes. came from, uh, and that's the information that I have Order. to hand that I present to the Senate as the minister representing him. Order. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Order President. On my left. Senator Watt. This is not my last question. <laughs> But my question is for the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. The federal government peak sports body, Sport Australia, is, is proposing that directors of Australia's national sporting federations have a maximum term of eight years. Can, can the minister state if the government supports that proposal, and if so, explain why the government feels it necessary to mandate term limits on sporting bodies, but not in other areas of public interest, like politics and corporate boards? Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Bernardi, for the question and some advice as to the general topic of the question. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, uh, the, Order. the current uh, Order on my left. ten years is currently regarded as the general acceptable minimum period for board membership uh, under the principles dictated by Sport Australia. However, it is up to individual sports. Mr. President, to determine if a shorter period would be more appropriate. Mr. President, Sport Australia's mandatory governance principles were first released in March 2013, then updated in June 2015, currently online, that national sporting organisations should have a staggered rotation system for board members with a maximum term in office of 10 years. Mr. President, there are no constitutional changes uh, proposed by Sport Australia for eight years at this point in time. I do note, Mr. President, however, that the, uh, since to April of this year, 2019, Sport Australia has been leading a process to review and co-create evolved governance principles. Uh, the process has included consultation with state officers of sport all state sport federations, national sporting organisations, SSOs and academic experts. Uh, the term of board members is one of the many principles being uh, considered under this work. Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the minister. Uh, in response to the chairman of Sports Australia's comments that an eight-year term limit was appropriate, uh, former Sport Australia board member Roy Masters has raised concerns that these proposed limits will impact the ability of Australian sporting officials to get on international sporting federation boards, thereby reducing the influence of Australian officials on the world stage. Does the minister agree with this assessment? And if not, why not? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say that I um, support the words of uh, Mr. Masters in uh, his desire that Australians have the opportunity to represent uh, sports on glo global forums, such as uh, Mr Coates currently does on the International Olympic Committee. I think it's important that Australia is involved and representative on these international boards. Uh, and, uh, and, and so we should have in place processes in Australia where the experience required to make those representations is appropriately gained through involvement in NSOs and other organisations such as the Australian Olympic Committee. So I support that, uh, I support that concept, Mr President, because I think it's really important. I, I might point out, though, Mr President, that it is not a, a requirement for Australians to hold uh, board positions or chairmanship positions in, in NSOs at an Australian Order, level, Senator Colbeck. Time Australia, for the answer has uh, expired. Um, Senator Bernardi, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm interested in hearing the minister conclude that answer. But I'd also add this: Masters reports that Australia now has its lowest representation on international sports boards, with 10 representatives across 40 international federations. Under the proposed reforms, all but four would be subject to mandatory stand down from these roles. Is this correct? And if so, how can this be good for Australia's sporting system? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As I indicated in, an, uh, in my previous response to the, the first supplementary question, uh, there is no um, requirement being considered by Sport Australia, as I understand it, as I'm advised by Sport Australia at the moment, for an eight year term. Uh, as I was saying in the conclusion to my uh, last response, uh, 
that there is no requirement for those representing Australia or re uh, being, uh, participating in international boards to hold an NSO position here in Australia. So I'm not sure that, that the circumstance that's being described by Senator Bar Bernardi with respect to those who currently hold those positions would apply. Uh, and I know that, uh, for example, uh, Matt Allen, Sarah Kenny, uh, and current World Sailing Champion Committee sit on world, the World Sailing Executive uh, and their recent resignations from NSO executives due to term limits would not affect international limits. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. After Senator Sinodina stood aside while being investigated, then Minister, Prime Minister Abbott said, and I quote, Senator Sinodinos has done the right thing. Ah. Why is Prime Minister Morrison refusing to ensure Minister Taylor does the right thing by standing aside while he is being investigated by the Special Strike Force, Strike Force Garrard, established by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad? Minister representing the Prime very Minister, much. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I can uh, tell Senator McAllister precisely why, because the circumstances are very different. Uh, here, here is, here is uh, an assessment by New South Wales Police, which has been triggered by a single letter, a single politically motivated partisan letter written by a political opponent who, who, couldn't, who couldn't get into the Attorney General's shop at an election, so he continues with his serial political smears. I mean, he's a serial letter writer anyway. Can you imagine if a letter from Mr. Dreyfus became the new test on whether or not Order. somebody can keep their ministerial Order. job? I mean, he would be writing even more letters. I mean, it's a completely ludicrous uh, proposition. You should reflect on it. You should reflect on it. Can you imagine one day, one day perhaps, the Australian people will elect you back into government? Do you want to expose yourself to the letter writers Order. on this side of the parliament like that? <laughs> do, you, do you really think that a job in the future that you may have should depend on whether or not a political opponent of yours writes a letter? I mean, that is just ridiculous. Order. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Simon didn't defend Order on uh, my left. Senator McAllister's on her feet. Senator McAllister. After Minister Bruff stood aside while being investigated by the AFP, ah. then Minister Turnbull said, and I quote, in offering to stand aside, Mr Bruff has done the right thing. Why is Prime Minister Morrison refusing to ensure Minister Taylor does the right thing by standing aside while he is investigated? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So, I mean, if you're going to go down this road, do you want me to go through the list of uh, former uh, Labor ministers and prime ministers who were being uh, investigated, who were being investigated and didn't step aside? Do you really want me to go down that path? Really? Order. Really? I mean, like, let's just let's just Order remind ourselves. On my left. I mean, you know, I think the media is well aware of the plethora of Labor ministers in the most recent government that were subject to investigations and stayed in their positions. Stayed in their positions. Uh, including a Prime Minister, I might say, including a Prime Minister. Let me just say it is completely inappropriate for you to suggest that a minister should be stood aside on the basis of a politically motivated letter from a political opponent. That is not an appropriate basis. That should never become the trigger. That should never become the trigger. Order. Order on my, around the chamber. Senator McAllister. I refer to the minister's earlier answers. Why is the minister bringing into question the decision by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad to establish a special strike force, Strike Force Garrard, by dismissing it as partisan and politically motivated? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I refer you to the public statements of the New South Wales Police Commissioner, who said the reason, the reason they're assessing it is because of the, the person that wrote the letter. He happens to be the Shadow Attorney General. He happens to be a political opponent. He happens to be a serial malicious letter writer. He happens to be uh, in the business of pursuing political smears. I mean, that is, that is, that is the track record. And let me tell you, you would not want, you would not want a single politically motivated partisan letter to become the test on whether or not uh, whether or not order. the minister is Senator Cormann, I have uh, Senator Keneally on a point of order. Uh, direct relevance, the minister is not answering the question asked by Senator McAllister, which paraphrased is, why is he impugning the New South okay. Wales Senator, Police Force? Um, I would ask people to not paraphrase. <laughs> Paraphrasing is not help, can sometimes be as unhelpful as restating. 
Uh, have you continuing your answer, Senator Cormann? Well, I, I, I reject the I reject the proposition that I didn't answer it. I answered it directly, and I and I quoted I quoted the public comments. I repute, I reject I completely Order. and utterly reject that proposition. Order. I reject that interjection by Senator Wong, uh, absolutely 100 per cent. I'm referring, I'm referring to the public statements by the New South Wales Police Commissioner, who made very clear why, why uh, the New South Wales Police is assessing, uh, assessing this particular issue, and that is Order. because Senator of a single Corbyn, letter written by the, the Shadow Attorney expired. General. Order. Order. On my left, Senator, Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Can the minister outline to the Senate the approach that the Morrison government is taking to protect Australia and its institutions from the threat of foreign interference? The minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Stoker for the question. Uh, Mr. President, the Morrison government is committed to protecting our nation our people and our sovereignty. Our government takes allegations of foreign interference and espionage seriously, and the allegations raised this week are concerning. As the Director-General of Security has consistently stated, the Australian public faces an unprecedented level of foreign interference, and we're going to deal with it. The government is not naive to the threats that we face. We have been actively strengthening our capacity to protect Australia from foreign interference. In April of last year, the government appointed the first ever National Counter Foreign Interference Coordinator to coordinate whole of government efforts to respond to acts of foreign interference and administer Australia's counter foreign interference strategy. In the last parliament, we enacted a ban on foreign political donations to ensure that election campaigning that targets Australians is not sponsored by foreign governments, foreign billionaires or foreign companies. We have introduced a number of legislative measures to tighten our laws to make it more difficult for foreign actors to interfere. These include the National Security Legislation Amendment Espionage and Foreign Interference Act, the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, and the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Electoral Funding and Disclosure Reform Act. The Australian people should have confidence that our nation is better equipped to deal with this issue, thanks to the strong action that the government has taken. The Morrison government will do everything possible to keep the Australian public safe. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What action has the government taken to ensure the integrity of our elections from foreign interference? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. As a government, we have taken action to protect Australia and Australia's institutions from foreign interference. Protecting our election processes is vital. To further strengthen our political system against interference, in the lead-up to the last election, we established the Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force, a cross-government task force. The task force was led by the Australian Electoral Commission and the Department of Finance and coordinated closely with Australian security and law enforcement agencies. The Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force agencies did not identify foreign interference that undermined the integrity of the 2019 federal election. We, of course, must be vigilant. We need to ensure that we protect Australians and our institutions from inappropriate foreign interference, and the government has and is taking action. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. <coughs> Minister, to what extent does managing a strong economy enable us to invest in Australia's intelligence agencies so that we are better able to protect Australia from foreign interference? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the unspoken benefits of managing a strong economy is that it enables us to invest further in our intelligence and security agencies. Because of our strong economic management, over the next four years, we are investing approximately $35 million into these agencies to counter foreign interference, including $6.7 million to the AFP, $8.5 million for the Office of the DPP, $1 million for the AG's department and $3.9 million for DFAT. Mr President, 
Our strong economic management has also enabled us to put $14.5 million into ASIO, and ASIO's budget for the current financial year is the highest it has ever been. The Australian people can be reassured that the Morrison government is using the benefits of our strong economy to invest in our agencies to keep Australia safe. Senator Sheldon. The question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Yesterday, the minister refused to rule out any watering down of unfair dismissal laws. Why? The minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, as I said yesterday, the Attorney-General has indicated that he will issue a discussion paper on the possible review of the Small Business Fair Dismissal Code. We know that the code, of course, arose from uh, Labor's Forward with Fairness policies uh, that they took to the 2007 election, which were ultimately recognised in the Fair Work Act. And when the Fair Work Bill was introduced, the then Minister, Minister Gillard, said uh, the bill provides a new scheme of unfair dismissal protections to ensure good employees are protected from being dismissed unfairly while enabling employers to manage underperforming employees with fairness and with confidence. Uh, Mr President, uh, I understand that the Small Business and Family Enterprise Commissioner uh, has reviewed a range of decisions and reports uh, on the effectiveness of the code and uh, indicated that the code uh, is not achieving its original intent. And there's a number of other points about its original intent that I could go into, Mr. President. But what the discussion paper will canvas is the views of employees of employers, of their representatives, on how the code might be amended Order. to provide clearer guidance Order. to small business employees and employers on the fairness of decisions to dismiss employees. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, the minister refused to rule out any weakening of the better off overall test. Why? Minister. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I believe I also indicated yesterday, um, the Attorney General is intending to issue, a, and the Minister for Industrial Relations is intending to issue a discussion paper on the operation of the enterprise bargaining system in 2020. And the object of that, Mr. President, is to consider ways in which enterprise agreements can be made and approved in a faster and more simpler way. And as with all other, other discussion papers, Mr. President, the views of stakeholders, employees, employers, uh, representative organisations will be sought and will be considered before any discussions are made. Because this government, Mr. President, as I also indicated yesterday, recognises that an effective industrial relations system should strive to balance the needs of both employees and employers. And that is why the Prime Minister has asked the Attorney General, uh, in his capacity as Minister for Industrial Relations, to take a look at the system. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Government members are calling for the watering down of unfair dismissal laws, weakening of the better off overall test, and the ripping up of the modern award system. Why didn't the government tell the Australian people at the last election? that it intended to introduce work choices mark 2 Senator Payne absolutely reject the premise of Senator Sheldon's question Mr President because the government was very clear and received a clear mandate from the Australian people in relation to our policies as i've said we recognize that Australia Order needs an effective left. industrial relations system that strives to balance the needs of both employees Senator and Watt. employers Senator we ought to have a look at the system to identify how it is operating whether there and where there are impediments to shared gains for employers and employees we can also ensure the protection of employees' rights. Any of the topics to be examined for review will be based on evidence and data, and we, rec we welcome input from all stakeholders, Mr. President. All stakeholders. I'm sure that will include those opposite. I'm sure that will include registered organisations. I'm sure that will include employers and employees and their representative organisations. And that is absolutely the way the process should work, Mr. President. That is absolutely the way the government should take input Order, from the Senator community. Payne, and that is what the, the government answer will has do. Expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Australian Government is promoting stability and security by strengthening the Defence Force presence in Northern Australia? 
The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar for his question. Uh, the Morrison government is very proud to be committed to building an ADF force capable of meeting Australia's security needs, and Northern Australia is vital to our nation's security. The substantial investment in the, by the Morrison government uh, in Northern Australia will enable defence to do a number of things. First of all, to increase awareness of our northern approaches, strengthen regional partnerships and also support defence activities and, in particular, training exercises. We are investing over $10 billion in the Northern Territory, West Australia and Queensland. Uh, $10 billion in the Northern Territory, $2.25 in Queensland and $420 million in Western Australia. We are committed to enhancing defence capability and presence through the United States Force Posture Initiatives by investing around $2 billion in infrastructure and support services in the Northern Territory alone. And I'm very pleased to advise those opposite, including Senator Stirl, uh, that these are now well underway. This initiative provides significant security benefits for Australia including deepening interoperability between the ADF and the US Marine Corps, increasing regional engagement and also positioning us to respond to crises in the region, including humanitarian assistance and also disaster relief. The $2.25 billion investment for the Australia-Singapore Military Training Initiative will provide significant local economic opportunities in the Shoalwater Bay training area in central and northern Queensland. These are all important in our changing strategic circumstances and are also important for Northern Australia. Thank you. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. I thank the minister. Can the minister outline to the Senate what the government is doing to deliver economic certainty and enhanced Australian Defence Force capability in Northern Australia through the United States Force Posture Initiatives and the Australia-Singapore Military Training Initiative? Senator Reynolds. Ah. Thank you. Order. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, thank you, Senator Scar. To support both the $2 billion US Force Posture Initiatives and the $2.52 billion uh, joint development of training areas with Singapore, this government is ensuring that we have the policies in place to maximise local industry involvement in all of these initiatives. Through our Local Industry Capability Initiative, contractors are required to proactively identify the capacity of local industry in the region surrounding all of these projects. For example, Lang O'Rourke is delivering training facilities in Shoalwater Bay, and they are engaging 80 per cent of their subcontractors from the surrounding Livingston and Rockhampton regions. Northern Territory-based Sitzler were recently awarded a significant contract to support the US Force Posture Initiatives, and they have committed to engaging 98 per cent of their contractors from the Northern Territory. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise how these initiatives enhance regional stability and benefit Australian Defence Force capability? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. Northern Australia is a critical part of our nation's defence posture uh, across Australia and also regionally. Strengthening the ADF relationships with key regional allies and also partners is critical to ensure that we can train, exercise and also deploy on operations seamlessly together with our allies. These initiatives strengthen the ADF's interoperability with two of Australia's most trusted and capable security partners, the United States and Singapore. Through the US Force Posture Initiative and Exercise Talisman Sabre, the ADF is working with our ally, the United States and Japan and others, to increase interoperability and maximise our regional engagement. Through our joint uh, development of training areas with Singapore, we are also expanding cooperation and interoperability with the Singaporean Armed Forces. Interoperability with our regional partners is central to developing the ADF's operational capabilities Order. here and Senator overseas. Reynolds, time for the answers expired. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. I refer to the investigation being conducted by Special Strike Force, Strike Force Gerard. Established by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad into possible criminal behaviour by Minister Taylor. Yesterday, Minister Birmingham told the ABC that, and I quote, the government will give full cooperation to their investigation. Will Minister Taylor commit to being interviewed by the Special Strike Force Gerard, established by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad? 
The Minister representing the Minister of Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, firstly, Minister Taylor has made clear that he will give cooperation to uh, to any inv any investigation. Uh, secondly, I would note I would note that the New South Wales Police Commissioner, in uh, in comments he has made to the media today, has made clear that in responding to the letter from the Shadow Attorney General, which indeed Minister Cormann, Senator Cormann, rightly characterised as uh, as of course being very much a politically driven effort by the Labor opposition. But in responding to that, the first threshold, the first threshold that the New South Wales Police will undertake is indeed considering the complex legal questions as to whether there is even a matter of law to be assessed there. So the nature of the question that has come there, which jumps to assertions of whether or not interviews will be required or the like, may not ever come to fruition. And the Labor Party, who asked for this investigation, you asked for this investigation, ought not seek to compromise the investigation by now politicising it. Order. By now politicising it. The New South Wales Police Commissioner has clearly outlined the steps that he will go through and that his officers will go through, and Minister Taylor has made clear that he will cooperate should that be required. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. The Australian Federal Police confirmed in estimates that Ministers Cash and Keenan both refused to be interviewed and failed to provide witness statements as part of investigations into the leaking of material relating to AFP raids on union officers. Order. Is this the kind of cooperation Minister Taylor will be giving to the Special Crimes Task Force, Strike Force, Strike Force Gerard, established by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, there's a bunch of statements in, uh, in that question that are erroneous in terms of the way in which they seek to verbal the Australian Federal Police and information that they have given in previous, uh, in previous evidence to, uh, to Senate estimates, inquiries uh, and other parliamentary processes. There's also still an assertion being made by the senator uh, that is getting way ahead of where any matter may be or may ever go to. Uh, and indeed, the senator ought to reflect uh, on whether his questioning is helpful to getting, to getting the answer that the opposition claims they wanted when they addressed this matter in the first place to the New South Wales Police. Now, those opposite, if they want to get an honest answer from the New South Wales Police, ought to avoid compromising the investigation by continuing to throw assertions around or make assumptions about how the investigation will proceed when, in fact, it Order. may never Senator get Birmingham. to the point Senator of such Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Given Prime Minister Morrison's complete disregard for accountability for his own ministerial standards and this government's history of showing a complete disregard for police investigations into the possible criminal behaviour of their ministers, what confidence can Australians possibly have that Minister Taylor will give full cooperation to the investigation into his possible criminal behaviour? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President. I think each and every member of the government would take extreme offence at an assertion that talks about the criminal behaviour of their ministers. The criminal behaviour of their ministers. A slur attempting across the board. The opposition, and Mr Dreyfus in particular, have a track record. A track record of throwing mud, of throwing allegations, of writing letters off, of writing letters off to police, to others, and what have what have indeed all of those letters delivered so far? Nothing. What have all of those Nothing. allegations Nothing. amounted to? Nothing. Nought, zip, Nothing. zero, zilch. Nothing, Nothing at Nothing. all in terms of all of yep. Minister Dreyf all of uh, uh, all of Mr. Dreyfus's approaches over the years. He writes off these letters. He's like a vexatious litigant who keeps going on and on and on, making the claims, and nothing comes to fruition as a result of it. Order. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitchen. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Wong, O'Neill, Keneally, McAllister and Chisholm. Now, Madam Deputy President, the most generous thing I think we can say about the member for Hume, Mr Taylor, is that he is the, most, the unluckiest MP in the parliament. <laughs> The answers today by Senators Cormann and Birmingham fail to not only address what has now become a daily display of failure by Liberal National Party ministers to abide by the Prime Minister's own ministerial standards—remember, these are the ministerial standards the Prime Minister himself enforces—but also to reassure the public that they are acting, acting in a way that they would, they would not expect of their elected representatives. 7.1 of these standards states ministers must accept that it is for the Prime Minister to decide whether and when a minister should stand aside if that minister becomes a subject of an official investigation of alleged illegal or improper conduct. It's the Prime Minister's decision. And what's he done? As Senator Birmingham said in response to a question, zip zilch nothing. He has done nothing. Today, the New South Wales Police confirmed that it had launched Strike Force Garrod to investigate the minister's in involvement in the use of a false document. Now, this morning, Madam Deputy President, uh, in my contribution on the Ensuring Integrity, the Orwellian named Ensuring Integrity Bill, uh, I was idly looking up the meaning of Garrod in Urban Dictionary, and I think uh, I'm mindful of the President's ruling on functions in breweries, but if you look up Urban Dictionary, you'll see uh, that it says it's the, uh, that Garrard means the dumbest—doesn't use the word person—but the dumbest person in the whole land. And maybe the New South Wales police have a sense of humour, <laughs> and that's why they've called it Strike Force Garrard. So when will the minister be stepped down? Oh, we do want the—I'll take the interjection, Madam Deputy President. We, do, we will take this investigation very seriously because what we have seen is we have a minister who is repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly breaching ministerial standards. And why do we know that? Because in the former term of this government, the former term of this, we've actually had a minister who did stand aside when there was a police investigation. We've had Ms. Senator Sinodinus about to become the ambassador of the United States. He stood aside. They acted properly. They acted in a way that was consistent with, consistent with the statement of ministerial standards. Instead, what we have now is we have a minister, the member for Hume, who has acted, who is under investigation. There is a police investigation ongoing. It doesn't matter the, the, why that happened. There is a police investigation happening. The, and, and, and again, Order. and again, I'll take and again, I'll take that interjection. It does not matter how something comes to light. If the police choose to investigate it, the police choose to investigate it. And in fact, what we have seen in this is, in fact, the police investigating it, despite the fact, despite the fact that the New South Wales Police Commissioner has now been. Um, improperly involved in the Prime Minister's own um, friendship that they have. I bet the Prime Minister is super happy that the New South Wales Police Commissioner, Commissioner Fuller, decided to actually to give that interview on, three, on, on 2GB in 2018, saying, oh, the, pro the, the, then treasurer, the then Treasurer, he's such a good friend. He is such a good friend. He takes out my rubbish bins. And, and, and what, in fact, the Prime Minister, the member for Cook, has done is he has actually, whether it was inadvertent or not, he has actually made it more difficult for the New South Wales Police Commissioner, a, a public servant, in, in fact, he has made it more difficult for that man to do his job without the question of bias being raised. And that, that is utterly, that is irresponsible. of irresponsible action. And, and <coughs> well, Someone has to keep you people to account, given that, given that you are incapable of implementing your own statement of ministerial standards. Exactly. Now, it is breathtakingly inappropriate that the Prime Minister would intervene in an ongoing police investigation by lever leveraging an old friendship in order to influence this. And if the Prime Minister himself did not have sufficient judgment, did not have sufficient judgment to, to Order. 
to actually not make the call, surely there are enough people in the Prime Minister's own office who might have thrown themselves in front of the phone to say, no, don't make the phone call. It's inappropriate. But no, oh, no. But we shouldn't worry about it because don't worry, everyone. Thank it was you, just an extremely Your short time has phone expired. call. Senator Seselja. Um, Deputy President, uh, and I thank um, Senator Kitching. I find it ironic that Senator Kitching is leading this charge, given what the Fair Work Commission and the Royal Commission found in relation to Senator Kitching's own conduct. I think they found uh, that uh, Senator Kitching broke the law by falsifying the right of entry tests and lying to uh, both Senator commissions Selger, uh, by denying resume such your conduct. Seat. If you actually read through the documents, you will see, and I'm sure you've been given that by the Prime Minister's documents, but I would, I would invoke Standing Order 193, Sub Order 3. Just on a further point of order, I'm not sure whether Senator Zelja knows what that is, but that's uh, about imputation, so you can quote correctly. Will you... OK, just a moment. You're quoting from the Hansard. I'm quoting from the Fair, Fair Work Commission. Beg your pardon. Yeah. If, perhaps you can supply us with the quote, because otherwise I would ask you to withdraw. But well, if I, was, it's a quote, I was quoting. I was yes. quoting from the Fair okay. Work Commission. So I'm, yeah. yes, I'm asking you to just, at some so, point, show us the, you know, to perhaps it's a good idea to table the quote. No, I, no, I don't need to table in order to quote. I'm, Senator, uh, resume your seat, Senator O'Neill. Mm. I know you're not required. I'm saying, in a spirit of good relations in the Senate. Uh, I've asked that you would consider um, tabling the quote, if it's a quote. I, 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 I note that request, and I thank, thank you for it. Um, so, I, so the quote the Fair Work Commission found on the totality of the evidence, I find that Ms Kitching performed uh, these tests. Ms Kitching's denial of knowledge and involvement cannot be accepted. So it is interesting, uh, it is interesting that it is Senator Kitching leading this attack. But let's go to the substance of what the Labor Party are saying. Uh, they are saying uh, that because the serial, uh, the serial letter writer, the serial referrer to the police, Mr Dreyfus, the shadow attorney general, uh, because he has written another letter uh, to the police and because the police, when they get something from someone senior uh, in politics, the shadow attorney general, have to give it due regard, they are saying now that should be the test uh, and people should have to stand aside. Well, what has Mr Dreyfus's record been? Uh, in the past, in referring, I mean, he has he has referred a lot. Nine matters, I believe, uh, he has referred to police or other agencies wasting their resources. He is a vexatious litigant. He referred George Brandis. He referred Christian Porter. He referred Stuart Robert. He threatened to refer Jamie Briggs. I mean, this guy gets up every time he gives a press conference and wants to refer someone to the police. How many times has it led to charges? None. None. So we've got the shadow attorney general who who couldn't become the attorney general, and and because of the poor performance of him and the leadership of the Labor Party, who couldn't get into government, uh, now want to bring down ministers uh, by writing angry letters. Senator Sasselja, you resume your seat, please. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. Deputy President, um, Mr. Dreyfus, of course, was the attorney what general. What is the point? So, in, well, in fact, incorrect information. Relevant. That's a debating point. About Thank you, Senator Kitching. Relevance. Yeah. Senator Seselja. Indeed, indeed. The frustrated shadow Attorney General, uh, Mr Dreyfus, who, uh, whose, whose party failed so badly uh, to, be, to make him the Attorney General and get into government, uh, now wants to bring down ministers by firing off more letters. Well, he should be seen for what he is a serial, vexatious complainant uh, with complaints that lead nowhere. He wastes police resources time after time after time. And what the Labor Party is now saying is now saying, well, every time the Shadow Attorney General fires off a letter, to the police, and the police then take that seriously because he's the shadow attorney general. Because he's the shadow attorney general, uh, they take it seriously. Uh, we should have to stand someone down. Absolutely absurd. Uh, we know, we know, Order. in fact, that the former Order. leader of the opposition, Mr. Shorten, was under investigation by the police Order. and remained as the opposition leader, remained leading the Labor Party, remained as the alternative prime minister. Yeah, this mob. This mob just sit there and they Senator interject Seselja, because, because the truth. 
I've asked you to resume your seat. Senator Sazelja has uh, the right to be heard in silence. I would ask people to respect his, that right. Please resume, Senator Sazelja. And thank you, Deputy President. Uh, but and, but I understand why they do want to interject because they don't like hearing uh, they don't like hearing uh, the truth of these failed attacks from Mr Dreyfus and from the Labor Party and the politics of Smith. What is this about? This is about the fact that the Labor Party can't live with the fact that they lost the election. And Mr Dreyfus in particular can't live with the fact that he lost the election. And so he thinks if he just fires off letters to the police asking for investigations when in the past he has referred other ministers, and where have they led? Absolutely nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. And as, Mr. as Minister Cormann made the point rightly in question time today, if this were the new standard to be adopted by this serial, vexatious complainant in Mr Dreyfus, the frustrated, angry Mr Dreyfus, who can't cope with his position in life, who's considering his position in this parliament, who wants to go off uh, and be a QC again, can't cope with the fact that he is not the Attorney General right now. Well, I've got news for Mr Dreyfus and the Labor Party. Uh, the way to get there is not through the politics of smear. It is not by bringing good people down. It is not by firing off letters to the police. It is by going and convincing the Australian community that the plan you have for them is, the, is a plan in the national interest, that you have the better plan. But you took a plan for $387 billion of taxes, of the, the politics of envy, the, the absolute politics of fear and smear is now being brought into our federal parliament to replace policies of substance. So we're not going to be lectured to by the Labor Party, and we're certainly not going to adopt this standard that the Labor Party never adopted, and we're not going to adopt a standard that when you get this serial, vexatious litigant, this vexatious complainer in the mis frustrated Mr Dreyfus, that we would have to stand ministers down. It is an absurd claim from the Labor Party, and they, should be, they would be laughed Thank out of court. You, Senator Mr Senator Dreyfus Selger, would be laughed out of court, expired. and he should be laughed. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And let's be clear about the facts. The New South Wales Police Force is now in the early stages of investigating information into the reported creation of fraudulent documentation. That's the quote that's on the public record from the New South Wales Police. Detectives from the State Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad have launched Strike Force Garrett to investigate the matters and determine if any criminal offences have been committed. And the way in which this uh, government has chosen to answer questions and to impugn the shadow attorney general for daring to ask for an inquiry is a disgrace. The New South Wales Commissioner for Police has been impugned in this place today by what the government clearly think is a clever argument, but they have diminished Mr Fuller. They have diminished Mr Fuller by, attempting, by attempting in this place to create a perception that he was incapable of making a sound judgment about whether to proceed or not to proceed. Mr Fuller, on the facts presented to him, chose to proceed with an investigation. And the minute he did that, the minute he did that, the Prime Minister should have taken the action that is required of him by the Code of Ministerial Standards. He should have implemented 7.1, which says these words, Ministers must accept that it is for the Prime Minister to decide whether and when a minister should stand aside if that minister becomes the subject, becomes the subject of an official investigation of alleged illegal or improper conduct. Well, it is alleged. There are many allegations that linger long around Mr Taylor, the member for Hume, and the Commissioner for Police in New South Wales, Mr Fuller, has determined that there is sufficient evidence for him to launch an inquiry. In the context of that inquiry, Mr Taylor, the member for Hume, should be stood down. If he hasn't got enough integrity to do it himself, the Prime Minister should stand him down. And this is a bloke who's got form. I am proud to be the Labor uh, the Labor uh, um, senator who looks after the seat of Hume, and to go there and visit on many occasions. And there's embarrassment in that community about the current member that they have. The $80 million water buyback. This is the guy who's that guy. The, the repeating 
misleading claims on carbon emissions. That's this guy, Grassgate. Mr Taylor accused of misleading the Australian parliament regarding his involvement in a scandal that's connected to businesses related to his family. That's who this guy is. He's got form. And we know that on the 24th of, of, of June this year, when uh, Councillor Moore and a member in the New South Wales Parliament declared it a climate emergency, which is endorsed by the council, they wrote to the federal government and it upset, it upset Mr Angus Taylor. He got so upset that he wrote a letter to Ms Moore in response to suggestions uh, in response to her and suggested that council should take practical steps. The problem is in the letter that he wrote, he articulated a claim that the council spent $1.7 million on international travel and the four and $14.2 million on domestic travel, which was completely at odds with the figures that remain today on the website that he says he acquired them from. The guy's got form, and it's all bad. It stinks to high heaven, and this government knows it, yet they are lining up well, perhaps not all lining up to defend him, because we have to go to Senator Birmingham's responses today. The shortness of them was uh, yeah, quite, quite good, actually. I would appreciate that more often. That, well, that's the minister's assertion, he said. Oh, that's Mr Taylor's statement. I refer to it. There is a statement that's been made by Mr Taylor. That's the degree of defence offered by Senator Birmingham. The reality is that, like rotting prawn shells, after days of cooking away in wheelie bins across this country, the stench of Angus Taylor is becoming more rank by the day. Like a primitive poultice, stench, that stench hangs now around the neck of the Prime Minister. Australians deserve better, Mr Morrison. Apparently Mr Morrison can manage to take out the rubbish in the Shire. He should be taking out the trash here in Canberra as well. I call on the Prime Minister, as my colleagues in the other place have, to stand down Mr Taylor. He deserves to go. He deserves to go. And the police commissioner in New South Wales deserves a lot more respect than a mate-mate conversation thank by the you, Prime Senator Minister seeking to influence. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. <clears throat> well, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, here we are, another question time, another take note. And we've seen yet again those opposite have nothing to offer the Australian people. All we see is more fear more smear and more negativity. Uh, these people are meant to be the, opposite, the alternative government of Australia. Where's the vision? Where's the inspiration? This is all about one letter from a political opponent in the other place, the member for Isaacs, the shadow attorney general, no less, to the New South Wales police to start a politically motivated investigation. Now, the Prime Minister has made the government's position clear on this, and it doesn't matter how many times you ask the same question or how many times uh, we didn't provide the answer that you don't like or we, didn't, we provide the answer that you don't like, our response does not change. This is nothing more than a distraction from those opposite to fool the Australian people into thinking that they're doing something. On this side, we're actually interested in governing. We're actually interested in delivering to the Australian people. We've seen this week, whilst we've been delivering historic trade agreements with Peru, Indonesia and Hong Kong, among many others, including China, Japan, Korea, as well as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they have a record of inaction. We have a record trade surplus, $22 billion trade surplus, while their record in government was abysmal. And not just that. We've seen the unions threatening at the Northern Territory Party Conference to dump MPs who support our position on trade. They are truly beholden to them. And then we have the Ensuring Integrity Bill, and they should be standing with us, standing with small and family businesses, including the 31,500 SMEs in the building sector, standing with everyday Australian Australian workers and standing with us against the lawlessness and the intimidation and the bullying in Australian workplaces, but they won't because it's not in their best interest. Rather, they're standing up for union bosses over the workers they claim to represent, unions over small businesses and family businesses, uh, unions over everyday Australians in the economy, 
and unions over the law. No wonder they're looking for a distraction. Over there, on that side of the chamber, what you see is a party so bereft of inspiration, of vision or of any plan for this country that they must tear us down at any opportunity. And when they can't get any traction on policy, they start going after people. They're afraid of our record of achievement. After all, we're standing up for everyday Australians out there having a go. We're a threat to them. We're growing the economy. We're delivering economic growth. We've put in place a business and investment environment which is creating jobs and providing opportunities to all Australians. And all they have is fear and smear. But that's one thing. But it's another. It's another to continue to talk down our country, to continue to stand in the way of jobs, of growth, enabling policies and productivity. Because it's not in their interest to do otherwise. But whilst over there they're worrying about annoying the, the union movement and whether they can take these uh, decisions or the, can support legislation that would support Australian businesses, we'll be over here governing and getting on with the job, undeterred. They just don't get it. The Australian people won't get caught up in their distractions, their politics of envy or their grievances. The Australian people are just concerned about living their lives, about working, raising their families and having access to world-class government services, which they deserve. And that is what we're delivering in the Morrison government. Here's Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Ayres. Thank you, Mr President. Well, today we have heard the most confused, inconsequential defence of a minister in the Morrison government who should have been gone yesterday and must go today. Uh, we saw the Prime Minister all of this week defend the Minister for Hume. Today in the Senate, Senator Cormann and Senator Birmingham gave wholly unconvincing accounts. Apparently this scandal is the Labor Party's fault. Apparently, it's OK to ring the Commissioner of Police in New South Wales about an active police investigation. The Commissioner of Police, who you've said before is your mate, is your mate. So you get on the blower to the Commissioner of Police in New South Wales to sort out the details. Today in the Senate, Senator Cormann dodged the question about whether or not the government and the Prime Minister was going to provide the transcript or other records of that conversation. They must be provided today if there is going to be any shred of credibility left for this government. This government is a government that is loose with the truth and doesn't have a plan for the real issues that confront Australians. Today and tomorrow, this is a government that wants to impose upon Australian workers a bill cutely titled Ensuring Integrity. Integrity? These people wouldn't know integrity if it bit them in the face. Who is this bloke? The member for Hume, Mr Taylor. He's had a golden run into the parliament. A square-jawed son of the squatocracy, finest boarding school education and university education that money can buy, a silver spoon doesn't touch the sides of the level of privilege, entitlement and unwarranted expectations that surrounded this bloke's rail run into the Commonwealth Parliament. The National Party, or what remains of the National Party in this country, even they stepped aside to gift a bloke from Wallara a country seat. What craven characters they are. He was described on his way into the Parliament as having Kennedy-esque good looks. People on this side of the joint said he was the hope of the side, a future Prime Minister. Somebody said—I bet it wasn't Senator Fear of Andy Wells—somebody said that he was blisteringly intelligent. How the mighty have fallen. The year of his pre-selection, records show that he made a $155,000 donation to the Liberal Party in New South Wales. Parliamentary life can be tougher than people think on the way in here. 
All he's done since he's come to this place has been for personal advantage, personal advancement and willful ideological follies. It's all come to a shuddering halt. This born-to-rule sense of entitlement does mean that he is a weak link in a weak government. What is his record? It's a record of entitlement, poor judgment, low capacity and the relentless pursuit of self-interest. In October, he was out there claiming, incorrectly to the parliament, that Australian emissions were going up or were going down when they were going up. He's already been exposed in this parliament for advocating to the then Minister for the Environment about a property that he part owned, an investigation of land clearing in endangered grasslands was commenced about his property, the property that he partly owned. What did he do? Well, he did what one college boy does for another college boy. He picked up the phone. He went for a meeting. I'm sure it was brandy and cigars. What can we do about this old chap? The Bunyip aristocracy in New South Wales and the seat of Hume lives on. Some farmers resent regulation of land clearing, some don't. But the law applies equally unless you're the member for Hume. This week's calamity is about forged, fraudulent documents that were leaked to the Daily Telegraph by this minister in a way that he cannot account for in order to damage an elected official in the city of Sydney. The, the New South Wales Police has commenced an investigation. He must stand Order, down today. Ayers, the question is, the motion moved by Senator Kitching be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, President. I uh, rise to take note of the uh, responses given to my question uh, to the minister by the Minister for Trade and Investment on behalf of the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. I asked the representing minister about the UN Environment Program report overnight, which is not very happy reading, I have to say, and it says that countries in fact need to now reduce emissions by 7.6 per cent every single year for the next decade to have any chance of globally us collectively meeting that one and a half degree aspirational target that the world signed up to in 2015 in Paris. Now, the, some of the language used is quite scary because the, um, the scale of that effort, considering we've just wasted the last decade to reduce emissions, the scale of that effort is described as unprecedented transformative efforts by all is what's required, according to the United Nations. But Instead, we sadly got the usual uh, response from this government that we are, um, what was it, meeting and beating targets and crowing about how we're meeting our Kyoto target, conveniently ignoring that Australia was the only country that got an increase in allowable emissions in that first Kyoto period. We were allowed to increase emissions by 8 per cent, so it's no wonder that we met that target. It was an increase. Uh, the audacity of this government to be proud of that is just uh, and a, and a national and international embarrassment. So I'm afraid that that really doesn't fly. The next um, the next premise that the minister went to was that um, we're going to be beating our our second target. Well, again, the only reason that Australia is potentially anywhere near meeting that target is because we are using carry carryover credits from that first Kyoto period. So essentially, um, we're cooking the books. We were allowed to increase emissions. We've banked some of that, and we're now going to use that to deduct off our existing emissions. Now, no other country is doing that. Other countries, including France, I think it was also Germany, have said that they will voluntarily relinquish those carryover credits. They won't seek to use dodgy accounting to try to swindle the world's climate. They will genuinely actually just seek to meet their targets without using these carryover credits. Australia is the lone country that still seeks to rely on those carryover credits. So again, the, the, the arrogance and the audacity of this government at trying to describe us as an international leader in climate policy, the actual wording of the United Nations Environment Program overnight uh, was that Australia had no major policy tool to encourage emissions reductions. 
And this government's trying to say that we're a global leader. Well, the point I made was that, yes, we are a leader in per capita emissions. We are at the minute the highest per capita emissions, carbon emissions polluter in the world. And even if this government's anti-science weak, weak targets were met, which doesn't look like they're going to be, but even if they were met, we would still be the world's largest carbon emitter per person. So this government has absolutely not a leg to stand on when it comes to climate policy, and the world knows it. That criticism from the UN overnight was absolutely stark. No, ma no major policy tool to encourage emissions reductions. Um, and in fact, they, uh, the UN took the approach of quoting back to this government their own department's evidence that shows in the next 10 years, in that now really critical de decade, since we just wasted the last critical decade, that in fact the department said that emissions would remain largely unchanged. So this is the department's own figures saying that this government's useless climate policy won't make a difference for the next decade, emissions won't come down, and, and the UN has picked up on that, on that data, and the minister simply refuses to accept the fact. And, um, again, he, uh, I think they're in a parallel universe because he talked about um, meeting the science. Well, if the science was to be met, then you'd be taking action to reduce emissions by 7.6 per cent per year that the UNEP has just said globally we all need to do. But no, 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 what they will do is continue to take the donations from the fossil fuel companies, from big oil, big gas and big coal, um, and they'll take that to the bank, they'll use it to uh, uh, get themselves re-elected, and they will continue to do absolutely nothing to address the climate crisis. And this is despite the fact that the nation is on fire. We're still not in summer, and yet in my home state of Queensland we've had those fires for months already. We've seen half the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef permanently die thanks to those two back-to-back -back bleaching episodes, which are climate-induced. And this government still just takes the money from big coal, big oil, big gas, ignores the science, uses dodgy accounting and has the audacity. Uh, to call itself a government. Order. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, no. The ayes have it.